we might as well get started. So um, today's lecture, we're going to continue on with our discussion of topic four, which was deal structuring, namely trying to understand and make sense of um, the investment contracts that uh, VCs and startups enter into as part of financing transactions, right? Um, what we did last lecture, for the most part, is we introduced the three main types of VC securities that are used in practice. Convertible preferred, right? Uh, participating preferred, and participating preferred with a cap, right? Those were the three securities that we discussed. Um, what we're gonna do at the beginning of lecture today, by the way, you know, maybe one thing I should also add is that we actually discussed those three securities in a narrow manner. What I mean is we only drew down payoff diagrams for these securities when there was only a single round of investment so that that security was the only VC security issued by the company so that the company on its capital structure really only had that security and common equity and nothing else, right? Now we know that that's not a good description of most startups that are a little bit mature. Most startups that are a little bit mature have multiple rounds of funding, right? And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna do two things. One is gonna be qualitative, intuitive, which is we're just gonna try to provide some explanation for why VCs require things like convertible preferred, participating preferred, or participating preferred with a cap. Right? Why do we use those securities instead of the things that we associate as being more standard with mature companies, namely common equity and plain vanilla debt? Right? So why is it that those two standard securities that we're more comfortable with and that we see in public markets, why is it that those securities aren't actually used much, if at all, um, in a VC context? So we'll want to make a bit of a, we'll want to understand that a little bit. And then after we have that understanding of why these securities, then we'll move on to analyzing those securities. And when I say analyzing the securities, I mean figuring out their payoff diagrams in settings where there are multiple rounds of funding, which basically that is what I mean when I say undertaking a waterfall analysis, which again, as I said last lecture, is one of the core tasks that a junior VC is asked to do. Sound good? On the waterfall analysis front, we're gonna do one or two examples today, but we'll do at least one other example next week as well, okay? Uh, before we start thinking about valuing these kind of complex securities. So let me go ahead and start sharing my slides. Can everyone see my slides? All right, perfect. So first part of today's lecture, as I said, we want to understand why these types of securities, why is it that um, these are the securities that are used in practice? Um, I always like to bring things down to first principles, right? So to kind of explain that I'm not going to give you the answer as follows because it's always been that way. Um, actually, that's not even the answer anyway. Um, no, it's really understanding what's fundamental and different and unique about startups and how does that guide the fact that A, common equity isn't a particularly good security to be buying and B, why debt isn't a good security to be buying. So it helps us dismiss those two standard securities specifically in a startup context, right? Um, and then we'll make a little bit of a sense of, you know, why the securities that we do see don't run into the problems that are highlighted with common equity and um, um, Sorry about that. Um, yeah, why, uh, why, like, why the, uh, the the VC securities are 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 kind of make sense in the shadow of the problems that I highlight, um, and then we'll speculate a little bit about the choice between the 
the, the different types of securities as well. So what governs that decision? You know, do you do convertible preferred or do you do participating preferred? So that's gonna be our first block for, um, for today's lecture. Sound good? All right, so let me first start with the first principles. What I mean is what are the key characteristics of startups? And part of this relates to the definition of startups that we gave in our first lecture and to things that we have highlighted as being relevant throughout the course of the semester, right? So let's list some of these, right? So one is asymmetric information, right? Um, founders have more information on the startup than the VC. Although, you know, one thing I'll say is, this is maybe a little bit debatable. Um, there are certain things that the founder knows more about the quality of the startup than the VC. Among other things, their own level of competence Right? But there actually may be some ways in which the VC knows more than the startup and its founders, like maybe a better understanding of the overall market, of the overall um, competitive landscape. So maybe what I should say is VC and founder don't have the same information. I think on average, the founder has more information. And part of the goal of the VC is to learn as much of that as possible to kind of narrow the gap. But there are some, you know, special settings where the VC might have a better sense of overall trends that allow them to assess things that maybe the founder cannot. But asymmetric information is something that is important in uh, thinking about startups and the relationship between startup founder and VC investor. And that divergence of information is likely to be stronger than the divergence of information that we are likely to see in public markets, right? Because these are just more uncertain areas and there's less public information produced about a startup, right? They don't need would to file say, annual filing. Go ahead, yes. Would you say that the, the like amount of information a VC has relative to startup changes along like uh, changes when you look at early stage versus late stage? Because in many cases for like- Sure, early absolutely. Stage. Sure, for sure. I think like the, uh, the, the asymmetric information gap narrows. So I, I think that's true. So anyway, but that's one feature. Um, here's another feature. And this feature is far truer in the context and the realm of startups than um, than, uh, than, than with uh, mature companies, which is founders are not diversified. Look, a representative scenario for a startup is that the founders have essentially all their wealth tied into the startup. Like if you look at their net worth calculation, you can remove everything except for their founder shares and the number hasn't changed potentially at all, right? That is like the least possible diversification you can possibly have. You're, you, got your, you got all your eggs in that one basket, right? Well, you might have all your eggs and you have like an, a little teeny speck of eggshell in something else, right? That's only because mommy and daddy gave you that little speck of eggshell. Um, there's a, another thing, they're not well diversified, but that position is not liquid either. So far so good. Like, that like a CEO in a publicly traded company is not in the same boat. This is gonna be relevant in thinking about things. As I said, super risky projects. That goes without saying, right? Um, here's another thing that's relevant in this space is look, the investors in startups, the VCs, one of the things we generally think they're capable of doing is that they're able to add value to the startup, right? They're able to add value because there are certain things that they know about the market. There's certain things they know about the life cycle of startups that they can you know, help guide the founders. They have access to networks that can be helpful for recruiting, for securing partnerships, yada, 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 right? There's a lot of different things that VCs can do to help the startup out. You can think of it a little bit as, you know, some form of active investing, right? They take an active role in the company. Actually, when we think of activist investors, 
um, in public markets, you know, oftentimes, at least the ones that show up in the media are settings where the active investor is adversarial with management. Here, it's, it's not adversarial, it's active, but like teammate, right? Um, so, you know, VCs in principle can help add value to the startup. But the question is, do they, do they find it worth their time to do it? Like I might be able to help you. That does not mean I will help you. It usually helps for me to have an economic incentive to do so. Make sense? So we're gonna think about that as well. And then differences of opinion, right? So this is maybe, you know, uh, a wrinkle on asymmetric information or maybe the, the two put together kind of summarize the type of information distribution that we've got between founders and VCs. My point here is the founder and VC won't always see eye to eye on the quality of the project. It's much easier to have a difference of opinion here when there's very limited information, especially early stage, limited track record, market isn't developed. So one of us could be more bullish and the other one more bearish. And so Jira. we might want to think about how that how that affects things in, in some way, shape, or form. Jiro? Yep. Just based off of that last point there, if the VC is not the one who's like, I mean, obviously the VC is going to do evaluation before they make an investment, but like, who's the one that's telling these founders what their thing is worth? Pardon me? Who, like, are the founders coming up with the value themselves, or do you think they're hiring someone else to come up with the value for the, like, uh, where no, both, both. I mean, you know, some, 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 uh, in some settings, the founders aren't sure what they're worth. Um, and so they'll either, you know, you know, go with some sort of intuition or they'll ask someone like, Hey, you know, what are things typically worth? And so they'll have a bit of a random number in mind. Sometimes they'll hire someone that they think can give them a, a more rigorous feel for stuff. Um, I mean, you see that you, you see it run the gamut. Um, you see it run the gamut. I mean, so I do some consulting stuff and, you know, I do, I do valuations for folks and I've done it both on the late stage and on the early stage. Um, so, so that get, you know, sometimes it is hire some, by the way, it can happen on both sides. The VCs will hire someone to help with evaluation sometimes as well. Right. Um, absolutely. Like these things can, you know, this concept of make versus buy like is literally something you can consider for almost anything that needs making. You can always ask yourself the question, do I wanna make it myself or do I wanna hire someone to make it for me? Um, you know, markets are pretty smart. So anytime that there's an incentive on the part of someone to potentially wanna hire someone to, to, to make, to, to, you know, to, you know, to buy it from someone else, there's going to be at least some cottage industry around it if it's something that's a valuable decision. Sound good? All right. So I'm not going to be relying on all of these characteristics for all of the things that I say, but I'll end up relying on some mix of them in some way, shape, or form across all the, all the considerations that I give you guys here, right? So the first thing I want to do is I want to tell you guys why common equity is almost never used for funding of a startup. And there's really two pieces to this argument um, to, or two different explanations. The first one is kind of, you know, material, but pales in comparison to the second one. Let's put it that way. All right. But I'll mention both anyway. So the first problem with common equity is that, look, if uh, founders give common equity, so they sell off 20% common equity in the business, right? That means no matter what the exit payoff in the future, they're always getting 80%. So if I sold 20% for 10 million and then my company exits at 5 million, I didn't do a very good job, right? Yet I get 4 million bucks, right? And you know, too bad for the investor, they get 20% of 5 million, 1 million, oh, you know, whatever, and minus 90% return, I still get my 4 million bucks. Like, you know, an investor might like to see you take a bit more of a gamble. Where I say you, I mean the founder. 
right? Because like, you're not giving any downside protection to the, um, to the investor there, right? And so if you think you've got a shitty project, well, why not raise the money anyway? Because even if you manage to lose 50%, you still get 4 million bucks, right? It seems to incentivize the wrong people to, to go for it, right? Because so long as you're able to trick someone into giving you the money, even if your project is bad, you can make out pretty well. Do you guys see what I'm saying? But what if the people with good ideas, they're like, I really believe in what I'm doing. I'm not trying to like fool an investor, right? How can I separate myself from like the sketchy founders? Well, I can separate myself from the sketchy founders by saying, look, you know, I get a percentage, but you need to get your money back first. So if I don't get you your money back, right, I get nothing. And I'll only take some percentage once you get your money back, right? I'm willing to do that because I have faith in my project. But someone who realized they have a crap project won't be willing to offer that. Do you guys see what I'm saying? This is something called signaling theory. And by the way, this is something you also saw in normal corporate finance as well, uh, if you've studied it, right? So, you know, as a startup, if you issue securities that give downside protection to the investor, you're proving to that investor that you at least have some measure of faith in your project. And since they don't know that initially because of the asymmetric information problem, that, that gives them more faith. It's like you proving them that you believe because someone who doesn't believe wouldn't offer that. Make sense? Equity doesn't do that. Equity doesn't prove that. And so as a result, equity is not particularly useful at giving the faith to the VC. And that's why, well, that's one of the reasons why equity isn't used much. So far, so good? The bigger problem is the following. And it's, sometimes, it's actually so big that it's been given by the old VCs. What I mean by the old VC is if you look at like the first wave of VCs, because VC really took off. It took off and it started in the late 50s. It was super small in the 60s and it started taking off in the, in the early 70s. So the people from the 60s and the 70s, um, they, have a, they, they, have a, they have a word for um, the real problem with common equity and it's called the take the money and run problem. Um, they gave it a name because they felt the pain from it. Uh, because when this market was first developing, um, you know, VCs didn't think too much about, about, about things. And they just said, give us common equity. And this was the problem that arose. Um, let's just give it some numbers. Um, I'm the startup. Um, Bruno is the VC. Bruno gives me 10 million bucks. Um, and I give them 25% of my common equity. So the value of the firm per that exchange is basically 40 million, so far so good, right? Now someone comes to me, Kanishk comes to me, says, Jiro, 32 million bucks, wanna do it? And I'm the one who gets to decide because I still own 75% of the company. So Bruno can't do anything, right? And I'm like, hmm, 32 million, 32 million, 75% of that is 24 million. That, that sounds pretty good. I can kind of retire. Maybe I can't retire in the Bay Area, but I can definitely retire in Montreal and feel like the man for a while. Um, seems pretty good. What's my alternative? Uh, my alternative is I don't do that. I've got this paper wealth of 75% of 40 million. Oh, that's 32 million. Oh, but of course, like it's not really there for me to use. Um, I actually probably will have to work hard for the next seven years. And I still don't have any, I still need to live in my shitty apartment and eat ramen noodles. Um, and no one is interested in 
uh, particularly interested in hanging out with me because, yeah, well, because I'm not that interesting aside from potentially having 24 million bucks. Um, so, hmm, is this 24 million looks pretty tempting now. I'll take it, I'll take it, fabulous, 24 million there. Oh, sorry, Bruno, sorry, it's nothing personal, nothing personal. Bruno says to himself, what just happened here? I just gave 10 million bucks, then Kanish comes, and now all of a sudden I'm getting, how much money? I'm getting 8 million, I lost, tw I lost 20%, I lost $2 million because of the take the money and run problem. I think all of us can actually understand that if you were in my position, you would go through this thought process, right? Unless you actually really believe, like, I look, I sold at 40 million just because that's all I could do. I think this is going to a billion. Like, unless you truly believe that, like, and you don't, and you're so um, obsessed about this that you don't care about eating ramen noodles in your little apartment for the next seven years, unless you're that person, you're gonna be super tempted by this. Yeah, so Bruno like had this happen like the, you know, three times. Bruno starts to ask like, wait a second here, there's gotta be a better way. What's the better way? The better way is Bruno makes sure he gets his money before I get anything. Right, so, you know, um, guess what? All of the securities that we discussed last lecture, make sure that Bruno gets his money at least one X, right? Because the liquidation preference, I said, I've never seen anything with a liquidation preference less than one X. That means you get at least your money back. If it's two X, you get at least twice your money back before I get anything, right? That fixes the take the money and run problem to some extent. Make sense? This is, the, this is really the main reason why common equity is not, um, is not used. It just creates these weird, these weird incentives. And it really has a lot to do with the fact that like when Kanish comes to me, I feel quite vulnerable because I'm exposed to so much risk, right? Highly risky project. And I'm so not diversified and so not uh, liquid that, you know, taking the money and running just, it, you know, it, it shit fundamentally shifts my life financially, right? So I, I think about it. There's nothing to think about when there's the downside protection because me doing this, me exiting early like this, maybe one would say me being an impatient chicken, right? Uh, does not financially hurt Bruno because he's got the downside protection. Make sense? Take the money and run problem, okay? Okay, so that rules out common equity. Now let's think about, you know, regular plain vanilla straight debt, right? So look, one reason why debt isn't used is because debt has a fixed maturity date. And it's really tough to commit to a fixed maturity date when you're a startup because you don't really know when you're gonna start being profitable. So there's one reason, and this one actually is not in the slides. Okay, but that is one of the reasons. Another reason is look, huge risk, large probability of failure. If you've got a project that has a large probability of failure, right? the required interest rate obviously has to be quite high. It would actually be outrageously high. It would look weird to see like what straight debt in uh, a startup would look like. Now you might say to yourself, but wait a second, Jerry, I've heard of this thing called venture debt. Isn't that debt? My answer is no. It's kind of marketed like debt, but it's basically, you know, debt that can be converted into equity under some conditions. And it's the ability to convert it into equity that keeps the interest rate on that debt down. But if this was truly real debt, straight debt, it would have a really high interest rate in the context of a, of a, of a, of a startup. Now, what's the consequence of a really high interest rate? The consequence of a really high interest rate 
is that now the company goes bankrupt more often. The higher the interest rate, the higher the likelihood of bankruptcy. And so when you have a really high interest rate, the range of air, like states of the world or exit values where the founder gets flushed out becomes materially larger. And that makes the whole diversification risk thing that the founder does probably doesn't feel comfortable about. It makes it even worse. It hurts even more. So they're not into that. They prefer to give more upside to the investor in exchange for lowering at least somewhat the range at which they've worked five years and end up with nothing. Here's another problem with straight debt. Think about the payoff diagram for a VC that owns straight debt. Once their debt is repaid, their payoff is flat, correct? They don't get any extra money. That means if the startup is doing okay and it's gonna be able to repay the debt, what's the incentive of the VC to add value to the company? Is there a lot of incentive to do that or not much? Not much, right? So all of a sudden, basically what this is saying is when the startup is doing okay or doing well, the VC won't answer the calls of the startup because they're like, why would I devote my finite resource to help this? I'm already set with the money. And I generally think of like a VC as being particularly helpful if things are going well because now the, the multiplier effect on them like pointing you to the right hire, them pointing you to the right potential customer, them pointing you to the right investment banker is all of a sudden more valuable. So you want them to not just like not pick up the phone versus pick up the phone. You want them to pick up the phone eagerly. Not gonna happen if it's straight debt. So far so good. That's why we don't see debt. Sure, this could be a completely stupid question if it is just like cut me off. Uh, but my roommate actually brought up this point the other day. Why could the VC, like, let's say it's a very, the founder, sorry, let's say it's someone with a good track record, like going, gone to a good business school or whatever, or is about to. So is this the VC just, or the founder that you're talking the, the, about? The, the founder, the founder. Okay. The founder take out. So first of personal all, went to a good business school is not, not, not necessarily <laughs> a highly informative signal of a you know, know, good founder did, or not. Yeah. Think of the best founders. Mark, Mark Zuckerberg did not finish college. You know, ja, no, neither did Jack Dorsey, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying like- a, Okay, like, whatever, whatever signal. Yeah, yeah, whatever signal indication to the bank that this person will probably be, be successful. Yeah. Would they take out like a personal loan to finance the initial startup cost. And that way it doesn't have the super high interest rate and it doesn't have uh, like all the downside you were just talking about right now if a VC took straight debt from a bank? Um, so look, here's the thing. is like If we're talking about like straight debt from a bank, look, there's a lot of mystery at the bank level as to like their inflexibility to consider non-standard metrics of ability to repay, okay? So like, you can have a setting where like someone has no assets, but they're just about to start a job that pays 250,000 a year, but they're just about to start. They haven't done it for six months already or a year already. The bank will say, we don't want to lend you $10,000. That's insane. But the, that's what the bank will do. They'll be rigid, right? Um, that's why there are opportunities for some non-standard lenders to swoop in and cream skim, right? There are some non-standard, right? Some of these FinTech plays are all about that, where they're like, you know, um, we'll look at metrics that the regular banking sector doesn't look at, but that we believe indicate good news for your credit risk and we'll, we'll make you a loan. Um, Sophie, S-O, FI, that's, you know, social finance, you know, they were an example of that. You know, they were willing to offer a better rate than a bank for people who had, you know, student loans uh, that were material. Um, but 
student loans from really good schools and seem to be on a track to have a really good career, even though they weren't really earning that yet. You know, that's what they did. That was their, that's, that, that they built a better model for that and they were flexible and th that worked for that. Like that, that seems to have worked for them. I mean, so Sophie has had other problems, but that seems to have been culture and, 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 and founder driven, a uh, bit of a sketchy founder, but yeah. Um, you know, um, look, Silicon Valley Bank is a little bit of a hustler that way as well, let's be clear. But at the end of the day, the product that, that, uh, that Silicon Valley Bank um, buys when they make an investment in a startup is not, is not straight debt at all. It actually looks more like convertible preferred than it does any form of debt contract because it does have upside because it can convert to equity when there's a future round of financing, right? Um, um, but yeah, I mean, look, there is, is there a possibility, Kanishk, that that can be done? The answer is yes, of course. Uh, to what extent is it currently done in the market? Um, at the very early stage, I'm not sure. Um, later stage, it's starting to happen, right? Uh, if you go and look, this is a, an exciting uh, Canadian fintech company, um, ClearBank. Um, one of the co-founders of ClearBank is a Dizotel grad, Charlie Feng, a great, great guy. Um, they actually do non-standard financing that has a little bit of a feel of a debt contract, but again, is not a debt contract. Um, they do revenue shares. So they give you a loan when they feel based off of their non-standard metrics that you'll be able to repay that. Um, and the way you repay is you give a percentage of your revenue as you earn it. So there's no due date. It's just, they're able to just take their little cut off of your revenue for every transaction that you have in terms of sales. And they keep doing that until you pay back what you borrowed plus something. They actually wouldn't use the word borrow. They actually explicitly say that they, they don't consider themselves to be debt. And there's a truth to it because there's no fixed date you must repay by this. It's a flexible thing. So if your revenue is coming slow, right, then they will be repaid slow. They actually take the risk and take a bet that your revenue will come in soon enough, right? So on the late stage, they're kind of a, they're kind of a non, non-standard play and they try to automate everything. Um, they do it for very specific companies. They do it uh, for e-commerce and for SaaS. It's actually pretty clever. I mean, I really like their idea. Um, so you guys should check that company out. By the way, one of the co-founders of ClearBank is Michelle Romano, who is um, one of the dragons on Dragon's Den. She's the only one that makes sense from a startup standpoint. Like she actually understands startups. Um, and then another uh, kind of primary co-founder is Andrew D'Souza. And I referred to Andrew um, when we did topic two. And um, you know, one of the videos that I have is him talking about um, you know, placing more importance on founders as opposed to project frameworks when he does very early stage investments, namely angel investments. Um, so it's really, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty, uh, um, uh, it's a pretty awesome founding team actually uh, with that company and they're doing great. Um, so I expect big things from them going forward as well, to be honest. Um, so I don't know, probably, presumably this has answered your question in some way, shape or form. Um, yeah. All right, so I'm just gonna say something really, really quick about, um, about the benefits of convertible preferred, participating preferred, and participating preferred with a cap. But I'm actually just gonna, to simplify, I'm just going to discuss this within, sorry about that, within uh, just a comparison of convertible preferred and participating preferred. Because I wanna ask this question. Okay, so, so far what we've said is it doesn't make sense to do regular debt and it doesn't make sense to do regular equity. And in both cases, we kind of explained why the three securities that we see used in practice, why those securities actually do a better job. 
But another question that we might want to know a little something about is um, how do you choose between one of the securities and the other? Right? What governs choosing convertible preferred or participating preferred? See what I'm saying? So let me explain what a choice actually boils down to. And so I'm showing you this and I'm just, I'm just ignoring participating preferred with a cap. It just overcomplicates the exposition of things, okay? Everyone okay with this being uh, the payoff of convertible preferred, right? You get everything until liquidation preference as the VC, then you plateau, and then you start getting slope when things are looking good because you just say, I want my equity, right? So this is convertible preferred, I'll label it CP. Now, look, when there's an interesting decision between choosing convertible preferred and participating preferred, it really boils down between picking this black option that I said and picking uh, an orange option, which I'll draw now. Orange option being participating preferred right? Um, notice the slope on the participating preferred is, sorry if it's difficult to see. Wait, I'm just realizing I forgot to do something that makes your life much more difficult. I should have stopped this share and showed you the big screen. Sorry. Um, I'm really sorry. It's kind of difficult to remember these things. Do you guys see like, this is an interesting choice on which one you might wanna pick. Do you wanna pick the convertible preferred or the participating preferred? It's not an, a pure, like an obvious choice from a purely financial standpoint because one security gives you more money sometimes and the other security gives you more money at other times. So that the, the value implication is a bit nuanced. Are we okay with that? You know, as opposed to if I drew a participating preferred where the slope of the um, orange line was the same as the slope on convertible preferred after you have conversion, then all of a sudden it's obvious that a VC would prefer the participating preferred because it, it always gives the same or better. This one is a nuanced financial choice. We okay with this so far? So what might guide the choice of PP versus CP in this non-obvious decision? I'm going to provide two stories for this, okay? One, incentives of VC to add value for startup. So under story one, Let's consider a couple of different regimes. I'm gonna consider two regimes here. So, you see this? No, right, so there, there's like this middle regime of exit values, which I call things okay. In the things okay regime, where, which scenario is the VC more incentivized to help out? The orange or the black? As a VC, would you be more motivated to help the VC, uh, sorry, to help the startup achieve a better exit 
in the black scenario or the orange scenario? It's a question that I'm hoping someone orange. will answer. Orange, right? Because the orange gives you orange. a slope, meaning if you add a little bit of exit value, say from here to here, you are getting a little bit more money. But with the flat range, you're not getting anything extra. Do we see that? Yes. Right. But, but uh, Jiro, could we argue that the VC could make more money in the future with a CP? Like, yeah, so but I just mean like, you know, narrowly. Right okay. now, you're hovering about here. I can do stuff to help you achieve a slightly higher exit value. I'm not really motivated in the black case. I'm, I'm somewhat motivated in the orange case. Okay. Okay. I'm thinking about it a little bit myopically here, just for illustration purposes. Good. Right? So this is kind of like a representative scenario when things are going okay, but not great. Do we agree? Now let's contrast, right? So when things are going okay, but not great, participating preferred gives more incentive to the VC to add value. Do we agree with that statement? Now let's consider the next scenario, the things are going fucking great scenario. In that scenario, which of the two securities gives more incentive? CP or PP? CP. CP, right? Because there's a higher slope, right? So notice when things are going fucking great, CP gives more incentives. When things are going okay, PP gives more incentives. Well, when we think about that, then all of a sudden, maybe we wanna think about what kind of VC are we raising money from? Is this a VC that helps me when things are going okay? Or is this a VC that really shines when things are going great? If it's a VC that really shines when things are going great, maybe I should sell them CP. And if it's a VC, that helps a little bit more at the margin when things are going okay, then maybe I should sell them PP, participating preferred. You guys see what I'm saying? Right? So this is a theory that says on the basis of incentives, I should size up my VC and decide what kind of help they provide. And that'll govern what kind of security I as a startup want to sell to them. Uh, the flip side is I as a VC know who I am. And if I know that I add value when they shine, I should basically request a CP. And if I know that I add more value in the middling things, then I should maybe ask for participating preferred. Folks okay with this? Now I wanna highlight a second story. The second story is governed by the last factor that I highlighted in my list, differences of opinion, i.e. relative optimism, right? Um, look, depending on the scenario, you know, one of two things can happen. The founder is more optimistic than the VC or the VC is more optimistic than the founder. So far, so good? If the VC is more optimistic than the founder, let's say you're the founder. Would you like to sell them CP or would you like to sell them PP? The VC is more optimistic than you. Well, if, go ahead, yes, Kanish. If, if the VC is more optimistic than the founder, you'd want to, the VC would buy CP because they think there's more upside in the future. Exactly, right? Like I, as the founder, almost feel that the VC is overestimating the value of the real upside. And so I want to give them more upside, right? Because they'll pay a nice premium for it, right? Meanwhile, if I, the founder, am more optimistic than the VC, I don't want to give them a lot of upside because I know they're not willing to pay me that much for it. So I'd much rather give them more money 
in the middling states because those are the ones where they think it's more likely. And so if I, the, v, the, the founder, am more optimistic than the VC, I might want to issue PP instead. My point is there's actually some economic considerations that go into whether you issue PP, CP, or basically what I think of as being a middling outcome between the two, which is participating preferred with CAT. Jiro? Yeah. Could you argue that if the VC is more optimistic than the founder though, and the VC is anticipating a lower exit, therefore, uh, sorry, excuse me, the founder is expecting a lower exit than the, the VC. In the case of CP, the, um, the founder would end up with more money because they're going to be in that middle stage. It's as good of an exit. And therefore, they should sell them CP, um, CP and not, and not uh, PP. Sorry, can no. you repeat that? Just repeat it one more time. Yeah, what I was saying is like if, if, the, um, if the VC is more optimistic than the founder, yeah. could you argue that you should sell them uh, like is, is another way of thinking about it that you could you should sell them C because they're not only willing to pay for it, but also if you end up in that middle stage, the VC gets less of a payout than they would if it was PP. Well, so I'm, I feel like we're saying the same thing. So I said, I said if the VC it's is more like optimistic, argument, they buy CP. Perhaps a different way of looking at it. Pardon me. Okay, a different way to look at it. So now explain. Yeah, I wasn't trying to come up with a counter. I was trying to come up with a different way of looking at it in the, oh. from the standpoint of if you are a founder and you are not as optimistic as the VC is, right? We see that the CP gets less of a payout when you're in that middling stage when things go okay and they don't go great. Yeah. So wouldn't, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? That's the flip side, right? I mean, by definition, since the things kind of even out, there's more money given in some states of the world, there's less money given in others. Right, so it's precisely the fact that less money is given in the middling states that make you say, oh, I kind of want to go with that because I'd prefer to get more there and give up a little bit more in this other thing that I think is less likely, but that they somehow think is quite likely. I think, I think I'm answering your question, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, but if your broader question is, are there other considerations beyond the ones that I'm mentioning? The answer is yes. I'm just trying to highlight the ones that I think are most material. I'm good. All right, look, at the end of the day, that's, um, that's all I want to say about, um, you know, why we observe these VC securities, convertible preferred, participating preferred, participating preferred with a cap, as opposed to common equity and common debt. Um, and, you know, give you guys just a little morsel, a little uh, amuse bush of the uh, choice of, uh, you know, do you go with CP or PP, for instance? All right, but by no means have I given you guys the full flavor on choosing between CP and PP. It's just, it's, it's a, it is literally like an amuse bush. Okay, sound good? All right, let's go on to other slides. I'm actually gonna skip, uh, oh no, I'm not gonna skip this part. Um, there's one clause that shows up in uh, these financial contracts um, that, um, that changes the payoff even when there's just one round of investment. And that's um, what we call a mandatory conversion term. So mandatory conversion term, the way it's typically written is the way it's written in this slide. So in the financial contract, we would have a term, it usually is even labeled mandatory conversion. And then following the label, we'd have something like all of the stock, all of the series J preferred shall be automatically converted into common stock at the then applicable conversion rate. That means the one to C that we described last lecture upon either one, the closing of an underwritten public offering of common stock at a price per share, not less than Y times the original purchase price, subject to adjustments for dividends, splits, combinations, and similar events, 
and net gross proceeds to the company of not less than D dollars. What this is saying is um, um, you will have automatic conversion. So P the, the VC doesn't get to choose convert, not convert. They have no choice. They must convert. So long as we have an exit, oftentimes it's a public exit, but it could also be an acquisition exit as well. Um, but that must be large enough. And the most common criterion on large enough is that it exceeds a certain exit value. There, there can be other conditions about proceeds raised if it's an IPO, by the way. Um, and then another condition, although this one is rare, is it would be a condition around getting the written consent of the holders of V percent of the series J preferred or of all preferred. So the reason why I have a square brackets thing here is it might not be mentioned at all, in which case it's a vote of all investors, right? At least two thirds of the series B must vote to convert the series B. And if they vote that way, every other series B must convert as well, right? So this is more about voting conditions to force other people to do the conversion. And this is about like the exit needs to be large enough, essentially. Folks okay with this? Uh, sometimes mandatory conversion is also called automatic or forced conversion. So this will be the last thing actually I'm gonna cover for today because actually doing a multi-round waterfall analysis, I'm seeing the time. We won't have time to do it. So we'll do it next lecture. Um, it's okay, we're not running out of time, we'll be all right. But I want to show you guys what happens with mandatory conversion. So I actually think of mandatory conversion in two, like two scenarios. There's non-binding mandatory conversion and there's binding mandatory conversion. Let me explain. Let's go back to our original example from last lecture where we had, um, where we had this scenario where it said, you know, we found in this case, we would want to convert at 60 and above, but we would not want to convert at less than 60. So far, so good? If we put a mandatory conversion term that says you must convert for exits above $100 million, does that matter? It doesn't matter, right? Because you're being told you must convert. You're like, whatever, I want to do it anyway. So it's like the condition is not there. So far, so good? Right? So if Mand if mandatory conversion is non-binding, in other words, it's telling you you must convert in ranges of exit values where you want to convert anyway, it doesn't change a payoff diagram at all. Are we okay with this? So I want to contrast that with a mandatory conversion term where it is binding, right? Same example as before. We would like to convert only starting at 60 but mandatory conversion is 45 million now. Then what that means is the moment we hit 45 million, we have no choice. We would like to stay up here, but we're forced down here. Do you see what I'm saying? So what does mandatory conversion that binds do? It changes your payoff diagram and it creates something really weird it creates a drop, a sudden discontinuous drop in your payoff. It's a really weird scenario because you as the VC are like, Jesus, I hope I get a $44 million exit instead of a $46 million exit. You see what I'm saying? Like literally a small increase in exit value can like, make you lose millions of dollars, like not small potatoes. Like you might actually try to sabotage things, right? If you're finding out, oh my Lord, the exit is about to be negotiated at 46, you might try to think of what you can do to make that number fall to 44. By the way, this is an example of a con potential conflict of interest between this VC 
and the people who hold common equity, right? Because the flip side is the common equity, right? The loss, this loss to the VC is literally a one-to-one -one gain to the common equity. So for them, they get this pop-up, right? So there is a, you know, this is like frenemies. This is like the enemies range and like, you know, friendship is kind of in this other range. Folks okay with this? By the way, we can start getting really weird stuff, which is like, look, we haven't seen multiple rounds of investment yet, but I'll just tell you guys a story. Um, and the story is the following. Let's say I'm an investor. Um, okay, so there's three parties. We'll still work with Kanishk, Bruno, and myself. So, um, uh, Bruno, you're the found, you're common equity, you're the founder. Kanishk, you're an investor that doesn't have mandatory conversion. And I am an investor that has mandatory conversion. Well, I, um, I'm worried that you guys are going to push a slightly higher exit value. Um, and that that's going to uh, hurt me. I'm not particular, I, I don't care too much about Kanishk. And I know like it's not just Bruno that benefits if I get screwed via forced mandatory conversion because actually some of that win is gonna go to Kanishk as well. Let's say I lose 10 million, Bruno wins five, Kanishk wins five. And let's say we're really talking about a one penny difference in the exit value. So that it's just literally like, I'm, I'm down 10. What five went to Bruno, uh, five went to Kanish. I might go to Bruno and be like, Bruno, lower your sales price by a penny. I know you lose 5 million bucks, but I get, I get 10. We're doing, we're doing an acquisition Right, and, and it's Derek's company that's buying you. I'm gonna go talk to Derek and I'm gonna ask Derek to bid, actually not one penny less. He's gonna bid um, $6 million less, but he's gonna offer you a sweet employment contract worth 5.5 .5 million. So you are now good, right? You're even better off than you were before. And, you know, Derek likes it too. And I like it because I'm not losing 10 million anymore. The only sucker in this equation is Kanishk. All right, let's do this. Right, so you start getting these weird games that can be played where because of the conflict, where there's this sudden point where some, there's a real winner and, you know, real losers, that, that you start to kind of game around it. You can get re weird stuff. There have been lawsuits around weird shit like this. My point is things like mandatory conversion can start to introduce conflicts of interest among the different stakeholders that can be actually quite nuanced and can lead to the incentives to form like these tacit, what by tacit, I mean like not formal, nothing written on paper, wink, wink, kind of collusion among subgroups. And these things get alleged periodically. By the way, this stuff almost never happens when everything is going fabulous because everyone wants to convert to common equity and everyone is aligned. But when things are kind of middle range exits, that's when you're likely to see this weird strategy happening. Folks okay with this? So I'll just say one more thing for today's lecture, uh, which is I'll talk about an additional term um, that uh, for some reason shows up in some of these investment contracts sometimes. And that's something called a redemption right. So a redemption right is stated as follows. It says, at the election of the holders of at least a majority of the series J preferred, so whatever, if I'm series A, 
right? If I'm the only one, there's no real majority election thing. It's like, if I want, I can do this. If there's three of us and it's at least two thirds, then if two of us vote for this, it happens kind of thing. What is the thing that happens? The company shall redeem the outstanding shares of series J preferred in some number, oftentimes it's three, annual installments beginning on the some start date, fifth, so in which case it would be some of it redeems at the fifth, some of it redeems at the sixth, some of it redeems at the seventh year, anniversary, anniversary year uh, of the closing. Such redemptions shall be at the purchase price equal to the original purchase price plus declared and unpaid dividends. But the contract could also say you get, a, you get an interest rate on top of that too. So it could say that. What it is, is it's a requirement that at some point you can force the company to buy back your shares so that you get some liquidity. Folks okay with this? So here's the thing. Let me show you some data. This is what's been happening to redemption rights, at least in the Bay Area. It's on the down. And this has been a secular decline over time. There's a reason for that. Uh, these things are becoming less and less common because um, it's actually becoming more and more difficult to enforce redemption rights as a contract term. Just because you write something in a contract doesn't mean a court will enforce it. If you and I enter into a contract that says, um, Jiro, I would never do this, let's be clear, but Jiro uh, agrees to give you an A, you agree to be Jiro's slave for the next 43 months. No court will ever enforce that, right? Um, you are not, you know, it is not legally allowed to give up your rights that extremely, right? Well, courts in Delaware at least have ruled that, you know what? You cannot force, um, you cannot force a company to um, buy back the shares if doing that is gonna have a material impact on the startup's ability to achieve its potential. So you can never do it to put them into bankruptcy and you can never do it even if they can technically pay but they need that money to fund their growth. And the reason why courts in Delaware have said that is because they're like, you know what? Forcing people like that, forcing a company like that looks like debt. And you are not called debt, you are called equity preferred equity. No, no, not allowed. Uh, by the way, the court case that established this pretty strongly is, is, is laid out here. And so because it's not really allowed, and by the way, even California startups in the US are almost always, you know, Delaware companies. Uber is, for instance, right? You know, Delaware rule is kind of like the rule in the US. That's why you even see this decline in the Bay Area. Folks okay with this? So yeah, there are redemption rights. My view is it's like, it's a disappearing thing. Even if it's in there, you know, ask a lawyer, but like my reading of the legal literature is that it's neither here nor there because it won't be enforced. Folks okay with this? Um, by the way, the fact that like courts have ruled, um, that you can enforce this and that this has made redemption less frequent. Um, does this, from your perspective, does this hurt or help the liquidity of the VC's position? Hurt. It hurts it, right? Like this is not a subtle thing, right? Um, you know, and you might wonder like, well, you know, maybe why don't they find another way to do it? Another way to get liquidity? Well, the answer is they have. They have, there's an, uh, another way for an investor to get liquidity now. And it's something that's growing. And Kanish, do you know what that is? No. <laughs> no, really? You're gonna... Secondary. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll leave it at that. Don't tell my boss. <laughs> yeah, I won't, I won't. I'm just gonna put it on the internet. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, um, private secondary markets are, um, are, are growing in importance. Um, 
And there's a variety of different private secondary markets. But you know, what is a private secondary market? It's some sort of market that is set up for buying and selling interests in private companies. Um, the transactions can involve individual securities that a VC or other private equity fund has bought. So my investment in Uber, a single series of preferred and a single side. It would literally, let's say I invested in Uber's series C and series D, I could just sell off the series D, you know, a preferred equity. Another type of private secondary transaction would be not, oh, I buy just a single position from the VC. I buy their whole portfolio for their fund, right? So portfolios of investments, the entire portfolio of ongoing investments held by a venture fund. Maybe the venture fund wants to sell that because they're reaching the end of life of their fund, their 10 year mark. And maybe they don't feel like they want to negotiate with LPs an extension of two years, right? So they just say like, look, why don't we just sell our legacy portfolio? And then we can satisfy our 10 year commitment to limited partners. By the way, the buyers and secondaries are also funds. Right. And by the way, um, there are also secondary markets for the LP shares of LPs. So if an LP wants liquidity, in principle, they can sell as well. Basically, anything that seems like a sensible transaction, a trade that you might want to have occur for liquidity purposes in private markets, I mean, it's either developed and semi liquid at this stage or it's being worked on. Because private markets have grown in size. So, you know, this is a growing opportunity. So being a major player in the secondary market is kind of an interesting thing. It's an interesting thing to start your career working in. Right. Not talking to anyone in particular, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, look, some of this stuff gets done through um, investment banks, you know, like, you know, maybe like one random example would be Goldman Sachs. Um, you know, um, another example could be that uh, you've got exchanges that are set up to facilitate, you know, people who want to sell shares in private companies and finding buyers for those. Now, those markets, there are examples of this. Uh, second market, share post. Um, those, if you want to be a buyer in the market, you need to be an accredited investor. That means you need to, as an individual at least, have at least a certain net worth or um, have some sort of credible way to show that like you're a sophisticated investor. I'm not even sure if being a finance professor qualifies on the latter, to, to be actually honest. Um, some of these secondary markets, it's more employees that shall, sell their shares. So something like SharePost, uh, a lot of it is typically employees. Um, some of it is founders selling shares. Uh, some of it is, as I said, the VC fund. So you see all this like richness. It's kind for, of like, again, you know, for, yes. for employees selling their shares in startups. So let's say like Mike has the craziest startup ever. I'm his employee, but I have like a personal situation and uh -huh. I need money because of it. Is there anything restricting me from selling those shares to like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Kanishka is asking a good question. Um, um, in my employment contract, there might be a term in the employment contract that limits my ability to sell in the secondary market. The most common one is one that says, if I want to sell in the secondary market, I must first give my employer the option to repurchase the shares. And by the way, it's a little bit sketchier than that, because it may actually say, I must give my, uh, uh, my employer the opportunity to buy back the shares at par. I, you know, the par was one and currently the value is a hundred. So like basically that like shuts you out of this. You, not just that, I mean, just do a Google search. Go, do a Google search for um, Uber golden handcuff. Because employees at Uber had this clause. And so they wanted to sell their shares. They could not 
even though there were a lot of willing buyers. And they couldn't leave Uber. Because another thing is if you leave Uber, especially if you've got options, is you need to exercise your options within X number of days. And then all of a sudden you have a huge tax bill. If you don't exercise within an X number of days, um, you lose it. And so basically you had people at Uber being like, I don't fucking wanna be here, right? But I have no choice, I am stuck here because these things are worth a hundred million dollars and I can't get rid of them and I can't leave. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I shouldn't, la- well, I mean, I can laugh about it because it eventually exited and you know, I'm sure they're kind of happy now. Um, but it's kind of like not the most pleasant thing, right? By the way, um, this is an interesting thing. This is kind of tells you about the dynamics of contracts, the dynamics of incentives. The reason why Uber, um, the reason why Uber put those things in the contract with employees is because of the experience that Facebook and Twitter had with employees in private secondary markets. Because Twitter and especially Facebook Um, actually, no, it was both. It was both. Um, They didn't put those clauses with their employees because when they set up the contracts with employees, the private secondary markets weren't developed yet. And basically like employees sold a ton of stuff on the private secondaries for both of those companies. And the thing is, those employees were so desperate to get liquidity that they were willing to sell at a discount because like there weren't too many buyers in the private secondary markets. So if I was a buyer in the private secondary market, I'd be like, oh, a lot of desperate people, you know? All right, there's a, there's a thousand employees at Facebook that wanna sell this. I can only buy it from two of you. Who's gonna offer me the lowest price, right? Yeah, the, the one that actually has a kid that needs an operation or something like that, right? You know, like there's a dis, you know, the market wasn't developed enough. And so there was a lot of bargaining power to the buyer. And so then you had some sales that were like suspiciously low numbers. That creates problems to Facebook because now Facebook is trying to raise at a proper valuation and a VC is saying like, why, why do you think you're worth uh, $30 billion? I, I just took a look at the private secondary transaction and it marks you at about 12 billion. I'm sorry, what are you trying to do here? So you can see it becomes a headache for Facebook, right? And so, you know, other startups saw that and like, hey, I don't want that to happen, right? And so restrictions were put in. So I would say that right now for the startups that have bargaining power with employees because everyone wants to work for them, they're able to, they're able to put in the clause, don't, employees cannot participate in secondaries. For, for startups where like they do have that bargaining power and they want to put on like the quote unquote golden handcuffs on their employees, yeah. Could another could another strategic rationale be proprietary information? Because like if a startup's picked up that much traction, it's likely that other startups are trying to do the same thing at yeah, the same time. That's a possibility for sure. That's a possibility. Um, you know, I mean, you know, here's a okay. Here's a naive answer. A naive answer would be to say, well, no, that's not necessary because I can put non-compete, non-disclosure, yada yada yada, right? So there are other things that deal with this problem that you mentioned. But that's like naive as an answer because it assumes that those clauses are perfect. And we know like in principle, you can sign an NDA and still violate it. You just need to find a secretive way to do it, right? Um, And so actually a golden handcuff might be particularly effective because it literally keeps you here. I'm not, like if you are stuck here and this is your net worth, I'm less worried about you yapping things away, right? Um, so yeah, so even though there are other things that are put in contracts to address the, the problem that you mentioned, Kanish, you're right, incrementally, this could be valuable because those other things aren't perfect. So that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fair possibility. Uh, by the way, in terms of private secondary markets, here's a video. Uh, this is Doug Leone, one of my favorite VCs as well. He's a uh, Long, long, long time um, a managing, sorry, managing partner at Sequoia. So he talks about uh, private secondary markets and talks about it mostly from the perspective of the founder and talks about maybe when it makes sense, when it doesn't make sense. 
So check that video out. It's like a zero two, three minute video. Yeah. I tried to watch it earlier. It's been taken down. Oh, it's been taken. You see, this happens with YouTube sometimes. Um, damn, it's, not even, it's not even on TechCrunch anymore either, because it was once on TechCrunch. It's not even there anymore. All right. I mean, I'm not sure if I'll be able to find it then. Um, yeah, it's too bad. Too bad. Um, but in, I, I mean, I have a choice. I could tell you about this, or I could tell you about something else that's kind of fun and interesting, and I'll tell you about the other thing. Um, I want to give you guys an example of a VC fund uh, making a carefully crafted strategic decision with regards to making um, to selling their position in a startup in the private secondary market. And the example that I'll mention, it's probably my favorite example of an individual stock or position level transaction by a VC in the secondary market. And that's a, a transaction that Excel, a very prominent uh, Bay Area venture fund, um, it was their decision about what to do about their early, they were the first VC investor in Facebook. Okay, so they got, they got, they got, I think the entire, not the entirety, but most of the series A for Facebook. I think they bought like 12 million at a $90 million valuation. And eventually they decided to sell something between 20 and 25% of that position in the private secondary market, rather than waiting to hold through the IPO. They didn't sell their whole position, but they sold a, a material percentage of it. And I'll tell you a little bit about their decision to do that because there's something interesting about Excel. So Excel had been a prominent venture fund for a long time. Excel really damaged their relationship with their limited partners during the aftermath of the dot-com bubble. Um, when the dot-com bubble burst, there were a bunch of venture funds that had large ongoing funds And those venture funds had to decide whether they would release their LPs from the commitments on those funds or lower their fees or stuff like that. And most funds chose to do that, reduce their fees and not force LPs to give as much money because now the perception of investment opportunities following dot-com bubble bursting in startup land was rather barren. Right, so Sequoia did that, Kleiner Perkins did that, like even the most reputable ones did that. And they did it to basically protect their relationship with LPs. The one counter example that I'm familiar with was Excel. They took a hard line stance saying, a deal's a deal, fuckers, right? Uh, that gave them a problem. When they went to raise their new fund, LPs were really pissed off at them. Uh, actually, a few LPs, decided not to reinvest, including Princeton University. Um, I think Yale University as well. Definitely Princeton, I know that. And so they were hurting, Excel was hurting. If they had another bad fund, it would actually be existential for them. So why did they sell some of their Facebook position? They said, look, we need to guarantee a good return for this fund because we can't fail it again. We can't do more damage. So they sold enough of their position to make sure that their fund was gonna do well. Doing well is returning above a three X on capital commitment. So they sold enough to be a little bit north of that. So that no matter what happened to Facebook and any other investment in their portfolio, they were reaching that three X threshold. That's why they sold a little bit because they were, they were really scared that if this fund didn't like fall in the top quartile, that they wouldn't be a bulge bracket VC anymore. So that's interesting. It tells you a little bit about some of the considerations that arise in these secondary market transactions. There's a lot of neat stuff. Sound good? All right, this wraps up our discussion for today. And now next lecture will be entirely focused on doing waterfall analysis. I'll do at least two examples, but I will also provide you 
with additional examples beyond that of waterfall analysis in handwritten extra documents. Uh, actually, those things are already available on the course website on my courses. So you can check them out there as well. Sound good? Um, next lecture is not gonna be next Tuesday because I actually have to attend um, this little thing called a house inspection for the house I just bought. Um, so that's my Tuesday now. Uh, it was the only date I could get this uh, premium inspector for. Um, so our next lecture is actually gonna be Thursday and our last lecture will be the week after that. But those two lectures are gonna give us enough time to cover absolutely everything that's left to cover for the rest of the course. Sound good? So I will see you guys not next Tuesday, but next Thursday, or I'll send out an email about that as well, okay? So I hope everyone has a good remainder of the week and a good early part of next week. And yeah, have a good one.